the crispiest, crispy, crackling stuffed roast pork. I mean, that crunch, I can't argue with that. Drizzled with a five spice cherry gravy. It's Christmas time, my friends. Let's make the best roast pork ever. It's holiday season time and let me just take the burden off that stress about what are you gonna make? Will it turn out? How am I gonna impress like Aunt Mary and Uncle Joe? All of those things, we can take care of all of those things in this one video. We are gonna make the crispiest crackling pork roast you've ever seen. Oh, I love this one. It is so good. I'm so happy I can share it with you guys. Let's get started on the stuffing part first. I'm gonna do a rice-based stuffing. One, because, you know, like I'm half Asian, so you pretty much have to have rice in your uh, Thanksgiving, Christmas, holiday season, dinner, lunch, whatever you're doing. But it also means that we can make it gluten-free. So if you've got some people that need gluten-free, this is a good stuffing for them. All right, the rice and a whole piece of star anise. And it's all these little details, these little bits and pieces of flavors and aromas that are really gonna make the difference here. So in that goes, and some chicken stock. Just stir that. And then once that chicken stock is bubbling away nicely, just turn the heat down, put the lid on, and there's not much rice in there, so it's literally gonna take like five minutes. So one of the things about having a whole bunch of people over, family, friends, friends of friends, someone's second cousin, is that you never know when allergies are gonna be an issue. So one of the great things about this stuffing is that it just happens to be gluten-free. As long as you make sure that you're using gluten-free soy sauce, also known as tamari. So in the meantime, let's do the rest of our filling flavorings. And I'm gonna start off with some very thinly sliced pancetta that I have here. Now I just wanna see how much fat comes out of that pancetta before I add in any oil. Now I'm not getting too much fat out of there, so I'm gonna add a little bit of oil. And some onions and some garlic. Now just give that mixture a few minutes, for that onion to get really nice and soft and sweet and for that pancetta to impart all of its porky goodness. So this is looking good. Just empty that out into a bowl. Now let's have a check on our rice. Mm, that star anise is already making my kitchen smell beautiful. Now just take the star anise out. And just use a fork to fluff up that rice. And now tip that in with your bacon. I'm gonna season with some soy sauce. And give that a good mix. I need to let this cool down before I add the rest of my ingredients. So I'm gonna pop it into the freezer for a good 10 minutes or so. So in the meantime, let's talk about our pork. Crispy crackling. Now, it is one of those pressure points for a roast pork at home, and there is nothing worse than having a really soggy piece of pork skin on your roast pork, particularly when you're celebrating and you're trying to impress people and you, know, you want cousin Martha to think you're the most amazing cook ever. Uh, so break it down follow all the steps, everything is really crucial here. Now for me, pork belly is like the ultimate piece of pork. It's juicy, it has beautiful skin that's just waiting to be crisped up. I want you to have a look at your pork though when you're buying it. So you want a really nice hefty piece, this is about two kilos, and have a look at the fat. Not all pieces of pork belly are created equal. Uh, you want a nice layer of meat, just a little bit of fat in there. Okay, so that's your pork belly. I want one two kilo piece and then I've got just a smaller little strip of pork belly that we're gonna put inside of the other piece of pork belly. You'll see what I mean. First off, we wanna create the kind of base for getting our really super crispy, crispy crackling. To do that, I'm gonna need a ruler and then my weapon of choice here is a Stanley knife. So I find even my knives at home just aren't kind of sharp enough to get in there and really get some nice score marks. So I always use a Stanley knife for that. And before you cut into that skin, I want you to have a look at the piece of pork belly that you've got and have a look at which way you wanna roll it. Now I want a nice long piece, so I'm gonna roll mine this way. 
And that means I want the score marks to go across like this. All right, so I've got that set up. Now take my ruler. And what you want here is a score line that runs through the skin into the fat. The scoring, make sure you're getting lots of tight score marks. Like I'm talking, what's this? A centimeter, a centimeter along. Don't leave it up to the butcher or your supermarket, which usually only puts about like a score every inch of the way along. That's not enough. Trust me on this one. The whole idea here is that scoring the skin and the fat means that we're gonna get a better render of the fat. So the fat's gonna render out underneath the skin, the skin's gonna get crispy, and you're gonna be left with just crispy skin and beautiful pork belly meat. And you want a thin enough separation that when you go to slice, it's very easy to slice into thin or thick pieces. You'll see how that works at the end, but a centimeter, my friends, that's what you want. Okay, so flip your pork over and then take that little random long piece of pork that I've asked you to get and just measure it out in here. Just see if it's long enough to fit the length of that pork belly. Mine's a little bit too long, so I'm just gonna cut this extra off. And then I don't want the skin for this middle part. So I'm going to just make a little cut in here and then just wiggle that skin along your knife to take it off. Now the other crucial element to making a success of this roast pork is salt. Salt and thyme, I would say, the two most crucial things. So I wanna be properly, this is a big hunk of meat, so I really want to be making sure I'm getting a lot of good seasoning in here. So I wanna season the meat side of the pork. So there are times probably when you wanna be trying to avoid salt, this is not one of them. If you want crispy pork crackling, you're just gonna to have to deal with the salt. Okay, so my stuffing is nice and cool. I'm gonna add in an egg, and the egg is gonna act like a binder for everything. It's kind of the job that, you know, the breadcrumbs would do in a regular kind of stuffing. Just mix that through. Now to amp up the flavor completely, I wanna add in some herbs. I've got some coriander, some spring onion, and then one little ingredient that's gonna add a whole bunch of wow. You'll see it just perfumes the whole pork and that is some lemon zest. Ah, and already that mixture is smelling so amazing. Ah, yum. Now the other thing you'll need here is some lengths of string, which is twine. Now before I do anything else, I wanna get my string all set up and in position. So I just hook that under and about there will do. I wanna make sure that string is really giving our piece of pork a lot of support. So I'm gonna use quite a few pieces here. Now you wanna get this tasty stuff all over your piece of pork. Spread it out, make sure you've got a nice even layer. and then that little piece of pork belly is gonna go into the center. And by using these two pieces, just this little piece here is gonna make all the difference with how tight your roll is gonna be, also how the filling looks, that little, you want that sort of like round circular pattern in your pork. So all of this is not just about flavor, but also aesthetics. Now this is gonna get a little messy, but don't worry, we'll get there in the end. So just kind of lift up your pork belly on the side here and roll it over. And you wanna make sure that you're getting a really nice tight roll here. And then what I like to do is flip the pork belly back over because I like to tie it on the underside because I find that's the part that really needs a lot of help. And now just lift up that string fold it over a few times, and then pull to tighten. Now just tidy all this up by cutting off that excess string. Oh, and would you look at that, already a work of art. Sometimes it's just such a joy making beautiful things in the kitchen.
Now transfer that to a tray. Now I did say that salt was one of the most important things for the success of this dish. And the other thing is moisture or lack of moisture. So I really want to get that skin really nice and dry. Pat it down. Moisture, it is the enemy of cr anything crispy. Crispy chicken skin, crispy pork skin, anything. So make sure you get it really dry. So get in there like towel dry um, with some paper towel and make sure it is super bone dry. I can't even emphasize it enough, dry. And then salt goes all over that skin. I really wanna get in there and rub it in all of those cracks. Okay, and to give this salt time to work its magic, we need at least two hours or overnight in the fridge would be even better uncovered because that air all around the outside of that pork is going to dry the skin out. The salt is gonna draw out the moisture as well. It's all gonna work to help us with our crispy crackling. So now the gravy. And what I love about this one is that we're not relying on that last minute getting the pan out and the pan juices and all that kind of stuff and then everything goes lumpy and then what are you gonna do? Cause like grandma's waiting for lunch. Uh, so let's make our gravy ahead of time. A day before, two days before, all good. I'm gonna start off with some chicken wings. All right, so a big giant Asian cleaver is like not totally necessary here. Any knife will do, obviously. But you do wanna cut those wings up into smaller pieces because getting that gelatin out from near the bones or in the joints is really important to getting a nice, thick, glossy sauce at the end. I'm just gonna add some oil into a pan to get everything started. And in goes my chicken. Now a little pinch of salt here. And I wanna get these chicken pieces a nice sort of golden brown color. You could roast these in the oven as well. But I always find around like Christmas time or when I'm entertaining, oven space is such a premium. So I like to keep that free. And once I can see a little bit of golden color here, I'm gonna add in some onions, some garlic and some carrots. Now here's where we start to make things a little special with some Asian flair. I'm gonna add in some ginger, some star anise, you want some Chinese five spice, and just this little dash of spice here is really going to give us a beautiful background flavor in this gravy. Just you wait. And then to add some sweetness and a little bit of an interesting flavor, I like to use a dark cherry jam. Any kind of jam is good here, but I particularly like a cherry or a plum flavor here. And for some color and some extra oomph, I'm going with a Chinese char seal sauce. You can find that in the Asian section of a lot of supermarkets now or from your Asian grocer. Give all of that a mix. Now deglaze the pan with a little bit of Chinese cooking wine. This adds a really lovely fragrance and aroma, but of course, if you wanna leave this alcohol free, just leave it out. Now I wanna season with some soy sauce. Again, if you're doing gluten free, make sure you're using tamari or a gluten free soy sauce. And now you want some chicken stock here too. We're starting off with quite a lot of stock here, a lot of liquid, but we're gonna reduce it down so it gets really nice and intense. Now bring this up to a gentle simmer and then let it do its thing for about an hour and a half. All right, so it is smelling amazing in here. And while this stock has been reducing, I've just been skimming it every so often, just the kind of gunky stuff that comes up to the surface. So this is what we're left with, and you can see just how much that liquid has reduced and intensified there. It's looking good. So let's strain it out. And then press down on all of those solids. We don't want to waste any of that liquid in there. Mm, that smells so good. 
Now, we're not quite finished yet. Pour that into a smaller saucepan. Just bring that to a little bubble. And now to thicken everything up, make it really super glossy, I'm going to add some corn flour. Just whisk that in. Okay, and then just like magic, look at that. We have a beautifully thick, deep colored gravy. And let me see how it tastes. Oh, wow. The complexity of flavor in that is so amazing. You have that beautiful hint of Chinese five spice, a little bit of sweetness from the jam and the char seal sauce. Mm, just perfect. Well, not quite perfect. I'm gonna add a little bit of salt here. And that can be just kept in the fridge until you're ready to serve. Just heat it back up on the stove top and you're ready to go. So growing up in a half Thai, half Australian household meant that traditions kind of got a little bit confused, fused. <laughs> and uh, whenever we're cooking special occasion dishes in my house, it tends to be a little bit Australian, a little bit Thai, a little bit Asian. Uh, we don't discriminate. We are happy to have everything in the one dish. So that's why, of course, my roast pork has things like star anise in the stuffing, soy sauce, Asian herbs, and I'm flavoring my gravy with things like char seal sauce and ginger. I think it makes something really beautiful. You guys tell me. Okay, so thyme and salt and the fridge have worked their magic. And let's have a look here. You can see the moisture literally sitting on top there that's come out of the skin. And we wanna make sure we get rid of that. So give this guy a really good toweling down. Now pop your beautiful specimen here into the oven. 20 minutes, really high heat, and then an hour and a half at a slightly lower heat. Times and temps are on the recipe on my website. Okay, now take a look at this piece of art that is this pork belly. Oh. Now this is one beautiful piece of artwork here. Mm. Completely joyful. Now let's lift that out onto our chopping board. Okay, so let's take the string off before we get too excited here. Just pop that out. So now let's get in here and slice this guy open. Now, because we went to the trouble of doing our score lines only a centimeter apart, we've got plenty of opportunity here to slice. Wow, look at that beautiful little pattern in there. We've got beautifully cooked pork. And if you have a look at the top here, all of that fat has rendered out and we are just left with crispy, crispy skin and some beautiful juicy pork meat. I mean, that's pretty much perfect. <laughs> I am one very happy camper right now. That looks beautiful. Aunt Mary is gonna be very impressed. I don't have an Aunt Mary, but if I did, she would be very impressed. Now, don't forget our amazing five spice cherry gravy. Let's have a look and see, shall we? Such a good sound. Even the smell, you know that little bit of lemon zest that we put into that stuffing and how I said it would make all the difference? Oh, it really does, beautiful. I mean, that crunch, can't argue with that. Wow, the crunch just never ends and the flavor never ends. I mean, the stuffing with that smoky pancetta flavor mm, and then that beautiful sauce as well with that little hint of sweetness and the Chinese five spice. <sighs> this is one very Merry Christmas, I can say that right now. All right, so I just had to eat some more pork again because 
I wanted an excuse to eat more pork. <laughs> but you know what I love about this? It's like, it's a total mashup of like Asian crispy roast pork, which you find in you know Chinese restaurants, and a really beautiful home style English pork roast, I guess. Mm. I mean, it doesn't really matter. Asian, Western, English, Chinese, a little bit Thai. I don't know. It just tastes really good and crunchy. Listen to that crunch. Mm. The crunch that never ends. So good. Sticky glazed spiced ham. Oh, this one is such a treat, guys. Do you know what makes all the difference here? And that is that marinade. This here is my ultimate Christmas ham spread. So in my household, guys, nothing says Christmas more than a glazed baked ham. I guess it's an Australian kind of thing that we do, but wow, everyone should be doing it. It's so good. Uh, now this ham is very special. It is the culmination of like years of ham making. It is my actual ultimate ham recipe, and I'm gonna do things a little bit differently to what you might've seen before. Stay tuned, I'm gonna show you all the tips and tricks. First up, we're gonna prepare the ham. So let's talk about the ham. Now I prefer a whole smoked ham with the bone in. The bone part kind of provides a little bit of a handle later on, you'll see what I mean. All right, so take your ham, and what we need to do here is take the skin off, but leave the layer of fat that's there. So start off by just doing a little ring around your handle. So just cut around here and then go to the other side of the ham down the bottom here make a little cut just underneath the skin and then now you really want to get your hands dirty so just get your finger under here and separate the skin from the layer of fat try and do it in a really neat way without gouging too many bits out of the fat because the fat's actually what is going to be the kind of top layer, the beautiful top layer of our ham. So keep going right over the top here and you should be able to take that skin off in one piece. Now the skin is something you really want to keep a hold of because you're probably not going to eat the whole ham all at once, or you might, but uh, if you're going to be storing your ham over Christmas, you want to keep the skin to put over the top so it doesn't dry out. So keep a hold of that. Now we come to the scoring part. So this part's really important because it's gonna affect the look of your ham at the end. So this is where you decide, do I want a diamond pattern? Do I want a stripe pattern? Do I want no pattern at all? Uh, I'm gonna go with a nice clean line pattern this year. Um, so I'm gonna start off about here and do one stroke where I know I've got the right angle. And then now about a centimeter spacing, I just want some nice, straight lines all the way across. So that is your ham prepped and ready to go. Now I'm gonna put this guy onto a tray lined with lots of foil. So one of the traditional ways to prepare a glazed ham is to have whole cloves stuck into the ham or you know little half cherries uh, with a toothpick in it and one of the complaints I got every Christmas I mean everyone loves to be a critic right but every Christmas it'd always be the person who would say oh you know I chomped into a piece of clove or oh you know I've got to pull the toothpick out and so I thought, you know, how can we fix this? I want the flavor of the cloves and I want to add more flavor into the actual meaty part of the ham rather than them just being a glaze sitting on top. So of course, a marinade is the answer to all of those problems. And can I say, it adds so much flavor. I mean, I don't even know why I didn't think of it before, but now it's an essential every year. Uh, now, let's get on to making the marinade. I want some ginger first of all. And some garlic. And some Asian shallots. Look, you could use red onion or French eschalots as well. Just roughly chop those. And I want some red chilies here as well. These guys are not hot. They're just gonna provide more of a kind of capsicum bell pepper kind of flavor, but you could make it spicy if you want to. 
And now for the spices. So we've got a really big hunking piece of meat here. So we really need to go with some really strong in your face kind of spices. And I want spices that remind me of Christmas. And to me, Christmas smells like allspice. So that's going to go in. And then of course, because you know I love to add Asian flavors to whatever it is I'm cooking, I'm adding some Chinese five spice. And actually the Chinese five spice brings a really beautiful, unique flavor to the ham itself. I really love it. And some ground cloves. And then now some brown sugar as well. And now a couple of ingredients that I think really help to get all our big marinade flavors into the ham itself. Um, first of all, some vinegar. This is malt vinegar. And now some spiced rum. So the spiced rum is actually going to add a little bit of flavor and the alcohol itself is a really good carrier of flavor molecules. So that's gonna help when the alcohol seeps into the ham with all those spices. It's gonna carry all that flavor in there. But if you wanted to leave the rum out, you could just add apple juice instead. And you want a little bit of salt here too. Now we just want to blend everything up. Let's have a look. And oh, you know, it really does smell like Christmas when I make this marinade. All those spices oh, and the spiced rum. Mm, yum. Now spoon our marinade mix over your ham. Things are gonna get messy here, guys. Just get in there with your hands and rub the mixture all over. Make sure you get some underneath as well. Now pour the liquid. Make sure you've got lots of liquid coming out all over the top of the ham because that's what's gonna seep through into those little score marks that we've made. Now just wrap your ham up really nice and snug. Now, if you can be super organized, try and get your ham into the fridge overnight. If you're doing things last minute, look, two hours is gonna do. So, of course, as you guys would know who have been long-time watchers of my channel, I like to confuse things a little bit sometimes <laughs> with my dishes and flavors, and that's just because purely being a little bit Thai and a little bit Australian, uh, you know, a few Asian ingredients seem to make their way into my more Western dishes. So that's why we're seeing things like ginger and Chinese five spice and chilies in my glazed ham recipe. So time to do our glaze. And I like to keep things really simple here. I start off with a fruit base so a jam and a juice you could go with whatever kind of fruit that you like I've done peaches I've done black currant I've done raspberry uh, this year I'm doing cherry so I've got some dark cherry jam and some cherry juice and to give our glaze some sweetness and some body so it kind of sticks and clings to the ham while it bakes, I need some brown sugar and some soy sauce because that's gonna give us not just a salty flavor, but a bit of an umami flavor as well. And some whole star anise because that's going to infuse our glaze with a really beautiful, unique Asian flavor. Now just bring this up to a simmer. I like to simmer it for about five minutes or so just to let the star anise do its work and to dissolve all of that sugar. So now let's take a look at our ham. This guy has been getting nice and tasty under that marinade. Now all of this stuff has already done its job. All of that flavor is in there. All of that liquid is seeped into our ham. So I just wanna brush the kind of roughage off. Now pop your ham onto another tray lined with foil. And then I like to wrap the bone end of the ham in some foil. Again, that creates a bit of a handle for us at the end. Now let's have a look at our glaze. All right, that's looking good. I'm just gonna pour it out into a bowl. And now the fun part, well, I find it fun anyway, but um, brush that glaze onto your ham.
And now this goes into the oven about 45 minutes. You want to be basting it every, oh, every five minutes, 10 minutes. You cannot baste it enough. The actual ham itself is cooked. So it's not about cooking the ham. It's actually about getting that beautiful lacquering of glaze on the top. So now let's take a look at our ham. Oh, what a little thing of beauty this is. Look at that sticky glaze. Oh, just slightly charry at the edges. You know, this reminds me so much of Chinese barbecue as well. Oh, okay, so let's get this out onto a plate. You can need a little bit of muscle here. Okay, so before we get to the slicing and eating part, let's have a look at all my bits and pieces. I have my potato salad. I like to also serve this with some bread rolls for, you know, mopping up all the sticky ham goodness or for making little ham sandwiches. And I also like some mustard as well. Let's dig in and have a look. Now that just looks perfect to me. For me, thin slices of ham are always good. My husband can literally eat his body weight in ham at Christmas time, so I try and control that, pull him back a little bit with uh, serving him some thinner slices. Uh, it also means that your ham goes a long way. So my five kilo ham today is great for, you know, 10, 15, 16 people to all be sharing. Uh, so it's a great way to feed lots of people at Christmas time, or one very hungry husband. And that, my friends, is literally Christmas on a plate in my household. There's no Christmas without ham. There's no ham without Christmas. Ah, a little bit of mustard. Let me see. Do you know what makes all the difference here? And that is that marinade. So many ham recipes don't have the marinade, and I don't always do the marinade, but wow, when you do, you just get that beautiful cascade of spices, the allspice, the Chinese five spice, the cloves, plus the sweetness from our glaze. Perfection, so good. On that creamy potato salad, I mean, it's just nothing better. Yum. Hello, Juicy Lamb. How do you make the ultimate roast lamb? We're gonna do this, my friends, and make an awesome maker head sauce. This is my ultimate roast lamb. All right, guys, I have all the little tricks and tips for making my ultimate roast lamb, plus like a few like kind of sneaky, weird ingredients. <laughs> because I'm me, you guys know, um, but we'll get to those things later on. First of all, let's talk lamb. So I have a lamb leg here. You could totally do this with lamb shoulder as well. Um, but I have a, a very large leg here. And what I want to do, whether it's lamb or whether it's shoulder, I really like to score the fat on the lamb because it means I'm getting a lot of marinade in there um, and it's also allowing a lot of the fat to kind of render out as it cooks. So you just want to kind of score in a diagonal pattern first and then diamond. And now the first step for my ultimate lamb is the marinade. Okay, so very simple here. I want some miso paste, soy sauce, I know, not your typical like roast lamb ingredients, but trust me, this is gonna be really amazing because you have the miso paste and the soy sauce just giving you all, all that, not just the salty things, but that umami kind of thing as well, which you guys know that I love. Um, and some honey as well, a little bit of honey for some sweetness. Now give that a good mix. Now there's a bit of a setup here for uh, your lamb in the roasting tray. So I've got some red onions here that are just sliced in half um, and that's gonna act like a trivet so that our lamb isn't sitting on the like hot bottom of the tray. So we've got some nice air flow around the lamb when it's in the oven. Okay, start there. Then we want to take some rosemary because mm, rosemary and lamb, they're like best 
friends. So rosemary on top of that. Now our lamb goes on top and then we want to pour our marinade all over. Now really give that a nice rub. I want to make sure that's everywhere in every kind of nook and cranny here. Now, I know usually you guys know that I would always advocate for the fastest route to eating good food, but this does need an overnight marinade. Trust me on this, it'll be worth it. So in the fridge overnight. Okay, so I did make one yesterday, just so you guys don't have to wait around watching paint dry. Wouldn't that be funny though? We just literally like watch the fridge for like 24 hours. No, good. <laughs> All right, we don't have to wait. Okay, so this one I did yesterday. Now, a few final steps here to get our lamb ready for the oven. First of all, I like to add in some nice tomatoes here. I love the color um, of the tomatoes at the end, but I also love the kind of um, umami flavor and savoriness that it lends to our finished sauce as well that's in the bottom of the tray. So, tomatoes. And now, so we've got our trivet with the onion, we've got our beautiful sort of fragrance happening with the rosemary. We also need some liquid here. So I'm just gonna grab some Chinese cooking wine and you could use white wine or red wine as well, uh, but I want like a good sort of two cups of liquid in the bottom here. And what that liquid's gonna do is it's going to allow a lot of steam and moisture to sort of get around that lamb. So we're, we're ending up with a really nice and juicy lamb. No one wants dry lamb. I guarantee no one wants dry lamb. Unless you're like crazy, which we're not. But anyway. All right, so this guy is nearly ready. We're just gonna tuck him up a little bit, you know, so he's nice and snug. First of all, I want some baking paper. Baking paper does two things. It really kind of allows more of that steam to kind of get around. Also make sure that nothing's gonna stick to the foil that we're now gonna put on top. And you want a really nice tight seal here. As I said, I want things to like steam and be juicy in there. And I don't want that steam to escape. Now, first part of this cooking is all about low and slow, getting things nice and tender. So pop this in the oven, three and a half hours. Yes, it's a long time, but you don't have to do anything. Literally, just go have a coffee or we'll actually, no, we have to make a sauce, but that won't take long. Anyway, let's get this in the oven. All right, so when I've got people over, the last thing I want to be doing is like last minute worrying about making a pan sauce. Like, is it going to get lumpy? Is it going to be a disaster? So I love anything sauce wise that I can make in advance. So we're going to do this sauce is like a two step sauce, but most of it gets done before anyone even gets to your house for dinner. So it's really, really a good, really good keeper. OK, first of all, we're going to start off with some tomatoes. Now, I love to use the whole peeled. I think they seem to have a little bit more like of a concentrated flavor. I kind of like that kind of chunky texture too. Okay, some more miso paste. Now I swear, I know I love miso paste. I, I really, I do not have shares in a miso paste company. I just, I just love the extra flavor that you get. Like you get the salty, but you also get the extra savory and all those, you know, bits and pieces. So some miso paste in here and I want some oyster sauce. Okay, now I also want some vinegar here. I know a slightly unusual ingredient for like a sauce, but I really love that just hint of acidy kind of tang that a vinegar adds here. And just a little sprinkling here of some Chinese five spice as well. Okay, so now for like the extra interest, as if like oyster sauce, miso paste, and a whole bunch of weird ingredients aren't interesting. We're gonna get even more interesting. Okay, I want some star anise in here. Now all we need to do here is warm this through a little so that miso paste starts to dissolve. Um, I'm going to kind of like mush up some of those tomatoes a little as well while I'm here. And just when that starts to bubble and everything's kind of looking well combined in there, I'm just going to turn that off and just wait for the lamb. So currently you should be smelling all the things right now, the lamb, the rosemary, the deliciousness. Um, let's have a look and see how our lamb is going in here. All right, so this guy is kind of like half dressed for the party right now. We have a really beautiful tender leg of lamb here, but we need to really develop more of that lovely charred color on the top. Before we do that though, I wanna get going on our sauce or finish off our sauce. So you can see all those pan juices in the bottom here, liquid gold, my friends, just scoop most of that out as much as you can. Pop that into that tomato sauce base that we made earlier. 
Just that final little scoop, kind of just drizzle that back over the top of your lamb there. Okay, so now I want your oven up really hot and this goes back in for another 30 minutes or until everything is looking really delish. So while that lamb is in the oven, uh, we are just gonna heat this sauce up because we've got all of that lovely pan juice in there and you just wanna keep this kind of heating up and warm and all of that pan juice and the tomato, they'll like make really good friends in there. Okay, so we are literally at the end of the marathon. <laughs> um, actually, I think you could run a marathon quicker than you could cook this lamb. That's right, isn't it? You can run a marathon. People run marathons in like an hour, right? So anyway, um, <laughs> this is this takes longer than a marathon. Um, anyway, we are nearly ready to serve up our lamb. What I want to do is get some of these gorgeous tomatoes out and onto a plate. Now your sauce, you can just have on the side, um, put a little bit on the plate as well, but this is the kind of texture that you're looking for with the sauce. See how like thick and awesome that is? And like, we didn't even have to do very much at all. No fiddling with the pan sauce kind of stuff. So that's what I love about that one. A little bit of fresh rosemary. And there you go, guys. My ultimate roast lamb. I mean, I know it might seem a little unusual, but wait till you try it. I mean, should we just get in there and have a look? Holy smokes, I mean, check out that color, the juiciness. I mean, this is what I'm talking about, guys. So like, you've got that ultimate kind of like charry crustiness on the outside, and then you've got that beautiful pink, tender, like juicy stuff going on in the middle. I mean, that is crazy good. I need to get in here and try this though. Uh, so, so we want lamb, lots of that kind of sauce. Smells so good. That is so out of control good. You know what's amazing about it is we've used no salt throughout the whole recipe, but the soy, the miso, the tomato, I mean, that's added like, this guy is like perfectly seasoned. It is so beautifully, beautifully tasty. But the texture of that lamb, it is so melt in your mouth, soft and delicious and like all the things. So good, yum.